Bueno, compañeras, compañeros, eh, vamos a dar inicio al último panel, al panel. Hey, comrades, we are going to begin last panel, panel number five of this great second international forum on socialist ecological politics. It is a pleasure to introduce you all to this panel that's called Before It's Too Late, Debates on the Post-Capitalist Transition to Socialism. That's why we invited Professor Fernando and also Mariano, coordinator of the Red Eco Socialista and MSD Argentina. So I want to remind you that on the bottom of the Zoom meeting, you can choose which language you want to listen <clears throat> to this meeting in. I would like to ask you all to mute yourselves so that we can listen to Fernando and Mariano. And during the exposition, you can make questions on the chat. I will write them down and then we will answer to those questions during the closure. Okay, so let's go ahead with Fernando. You can share the, the presentation. You have to share your screen. Donde está interpretación, grabar, dice compartir pantalla. There where it says record, you have an icon that says share screen. If you have that presentation, entonces lo que podemos hacer es que nos mande el PowerPoint y compartimos pantalla nosotros. Okay, you can send us the presentation and we can share our own screen. One minute, please, everyone. I will send you our phone number so that you can share it with us and then we can share our screen. Puede ser Jesse que está administrando, no hay problema. Vos a medida que vayas explicando, pedís siguiente, siguiente, siguiente y vamos pasando. ¿Puede bueno. ser? Las vas a ver, las vas a ver igual que el resto. Listo. Entonces. Hagamos. Ok, then perfect. One moment, please. ¿Por qué no me aparece, por qué no me aparece esa, esa, esa pestaña compartir aquí? No sabemos, debería, porque sos coanfitrión. Algo no hice que debería haber hecho. Es probable, pero no ya sé no. qué pasa. Perfecto. Ahí está, mira. ¿Cómo hago ahí, para enviarte? Ahí. Nos conectamos por nos conectamos por WhatsApp. ¿Tienes un correo? Tengo un correo, sí. Ya te paso un correo mejor. Ahí va. Sí. Ahí está. Dime, para... ¿Cuál es el correo? Mariano Sebastián Rosa. Mariano Sebastián Rosa. Arroba gmail.com. Arroba Hotmail, Gmail. Gmail.com. Mariano Sebastián Rosa, listo. Eh, ¿Dónde estás? Uh, 
¿Qué pasa? Paciencia que ya sale, ¿eh? nos mandamos el PowerPoint. Y ya moment, está. please. Um, be patient. These are the difficulties of online sessions. So please um, be patient and we will begin soon. Ahí se fue. Bueno, bueno. Ahí lo activamos, Fernando. ¿Te llegó? Sí, sí. sí. Recording stopped. Segundo. Yo por qué perdí la conexión con ustedes. Ya, ya, ya. Dos. One minute, please. We are about to begin. Ah, ya. Yeah. Lamentablemente, no creo que tenga vuelta otra vez. Un minuto y lo tenemos. Es como Godot, eh, Fernando. Está bien. A ver ahí. Ahí se ve. Ok, can you see it now? Listo. Done. Vamos a empezar. Como quieras.
Dale vos, Jessy, nomás. Listo, presente. Ok, let's begin. Ahora lo más. Perdón. Dale, Fer. Go ahead. Te voy a leer. Ok, I'm going to read a text. La the destruction of natural ecosystems and the increase of global warming is producing a environmental crisis that threatens to destroy the conditions needed for the existence of humanity in our planet. That is to say that if this process continues, there is no future for humanity. It's an apocalypse. So now global temperature has increased to unprecedented levels in the history of humanity. Mariana, la otra. Next slide, please. One moment, please. Is there an issue? Yes, one more minute. Global warming, global warming cannot be solved if we do not solve the issue of the destruction of natural ecosystems. They increase each other mutually. For example, uh, phytoplankton destruction on the sea do not allow the planet to absorb carbon emissions. So the UN acknowledged that the environmental crisis and poverty crisis was an issue of developing capitalism. They, that it's why they uh, developed the um, concept of sustainable development. So taking measures in order not to damage the environment and not um, increasing poverty. Nature affirmed recently the objectives of sustainable um, development of the UN are falling down. That is to say that all Congresses and efforts for many decades that have been carried out around those objectives have failed. And why is that? Generally, because those measures are partial and do not attack any of the sources of those issues. The measures that prohibit certain economic practices, which are damaging to the environment, have proven to be uh, not to be useful at all. It just promotes change uh, in the head of governments or even more flexible uh, measures. The UN is right. Capitalism is the one responsible for the environmental crisis. And it is because it is a kind of um, economy that is established with the only and sole purpose of generating profits. That's the and key element since its economical, economic growth and development depends on its level of profit. It will do whatever it needs to do to increase them. It will do whatever necessary to avoid those profits from decreasing. And that's why it is not sustainable. That's why its model of production to produce profit, to produce capital, it has to pro produce um, goods as if they were products to which workers add a new value. In order for them to be effective, they have to sell those products to those who have money to buy them. And then we have the fact of speed to produce and to sell products as fast as possible. So that with less capital, they can um, guarantee more cycles of production and create more profits. In order to produce those products, capitalism has to exploit nature. 
Ah, es que se, se desactivó un, una función que tenía eso. Bien. Para producir sus mercados. In order to produce, they have to. Thank you. Capitalism needs to exploit nature. Yes. That's where they get their um, raw materials from. That's where they get their raw material for agriculture, livestock, fishing. That's where they will build infrastructure and cities, and they have to exploit them with less investment each time and less time each time, which results in a really negative uh, impact on nature. And nature renews itself really slowly compared to capitalism, ca capitalist uh, mode of production. To restore it or to rebuild it would increase the investment they need to do and would diminish their profits. Any measures taken in favor of the environment are forced by activists or any other agreement, and they will just go to a place where those measures are not needed or places in which they are not forced to apply those measures. There are millions of capitalists, um, individual or collective capitalists that do the same thing without control. Those are free investment um, companies and they compete with other capitalists. So that's why they need to produce with, with less, less investment and faster than before. We have uh, new companies and there are millions of them being created each day and they produce goods that are not sold. So they go bankrupt. There are masses of material capital that are wasted and then energetic resources and raw materials are also wasted. Competence, competition is a struggle that capitalists um, develop in the market in order to increase their profit levels. And it is an intense competition if we take into consideration that the um, profit uh, generation tendency um, is lower and it is an unequal competition but there are the big capitals that abandon uh, many branches of production that do not create uh, enough profits as they want them to and since every capitalist acts on its own, this um, collective is actually anarchists and unequal. And in the same way, um, nature is exploited unequally and in an anarchist um, mood of production. In order to create profit, capitalism turns almost everything in profitable products. It divides useful and unuseful products and try to sell everything as if it was a good or commodity. And it has an extraordinary element of nature exploitation. And so as all of these products have to be sold, they promote consumption. And they produce and super produce along with uh, technological advances. There are huge amounts of waste produced by this model. So capitalism is has a waste culture wasted um, energetic resources, raw materials, and all kinds of different materials used for its chain of production. 
everything that's wasted massively also includes human resources and natural resources. For capitalism, development means more profit and more goods with all the added value from workers, something that develops um, productive forces to produce even more goods, more capital, and more development means more destruction. And in this globalization process, we have global warming and environmental crisis. According to the Commercial World Organization, the global market has grown four, time, four times its size in the last few years. And there are permanent consequences to those processes. More consumption of fossil fuels and all kinds of energy sources. Increased levels of energy production that results in more gas emissions with 1,400 million vehicles, for example, livestock, agriculture, and many others. And that's why global warming has reached its current levels. From its creation, capitalism has implanted their physical infrastructures and cities, destroying natural ecosystems. Those are networks that express the pressure of millions of capitalists with different um, levels of development. And they are structured in unequal um, levels and changing conditions. Um, transportation systems have been built in a fragmented matter and slicing nature. And those uh, models are not um, subscribed to any global long-term plan. Their development is unequal and the way they are built actually have different, uh, not as damaging alternatives in which those uh, negative results and impact could be diminished. Capitalism, it's not sustainable because it's a powerful form of development as well as of destruction. It also, it boosts at the same time as it curbs the productive forces. And this contradiction can cannot be escaped. Up. There's a need of adding value to this um, private capital that makes, makes this contradiction uh, unable to be solved. Capitalism is dual with the same means that they have been able to conquer progress. They are destroying the natural um, conditions. It only develops technique, techniques and destroys the two sources of this wealth, uh, nature and workforce. It is the main um, source of environmental destruction, of environmental crisis, of social and economic crisis. Capitalism has created the material conditions and social conditions to surpass this contradiction. It has developed technology and ways of organizing collective work in every company and has created a great uh, work way of organizing workers. But it is at the service of private interests. The solution would start at the moment that those workers free themselves from the control of capitalists. And at the moment that they start organizing to um, work for the necessities and interests of the majorities, there will be great and deep changes. 
Sorry, previous slide. There could be really deep changes. We would go through uh, from an economy that's controlled by capitalists to one controlled by workers, which objective would be to satisfy humanity needs and rebuild nature and guarantee its protection. We will go from a selfish economy that feeds itself, that produces capital in order to get more capital to an economy that's controlled by workers, solidarity, and for humans to be a mean, but also an objective. We will go from, from uh, private plans to one that's planned democratically and collectively by workers. We would go from a competitive economy to one that wants to surpass necessities and that would uh, break apart from overproduction. This would create a huge leap in production forces development. That would be to integrate knowledge and technology in the whole uh, production branch. What pharmaceuticals, uh, what pharma companies wouldn't want to do during the pandemic. There is no solution in capitalism. Only a humanitarian economy can be sustainable. It is true that we cannot exist without cities and communication and transportation systems, without agriculture, without livestock, without technology. But we cannot either um, survive without water, without air, without land, without all the um, benefit that the nature that nature provides us with. It is a limited resource. We would resort to science so that every damage that is necessary um, for this um, kind of production is able to be um, restored. We will have the means for three, three tasks diminish carbon emissions, for example, reducing uh, energy consumption, the use of individual vehicles by spreading the uh, transportation system, would reduce uh, nature exploitation, protect its balance. For example, there are many uh, technical proposals um, regarding um, agriculture in order to free land. To start an harmonic integration between the human and nature world. To reduce the size of many cities by repopulate, repopulating um, different regions. To create a new balance between technological systems and nature systems. We know that it is possible to ensure both um, spheres and guarantee humanity's future. Only if we decide all of these things democratically. It cannot be solved par partially or by region or by country because um, natural ecosystems and climate, climate conditions are deeply linked in a global level. And because capitalist economy is a universal system that's articulated by global market. So we cannot solve it by diminishing some of its results. You cannot cure an infection just by um, temporarily dealing with a fever. So you cannot cure infection by dealing only with fever. 
And I want to quote the General Secretary of the UN. Our world needs uh, climate action in all fronts, all everywhere, all at once. The solution has to be international, but we have to point out that the greatest responsibility is in countries with the most developed capitalism. They also have the most advanced technological and social resources to do so. And we can see that in that in this image. Here you can see you can see how much um, emissions are there in each country that the greatest emissions are present in the um, North Hemisphere, China, Japan, Europe, United States. That's where the most advanced capitalism is. Those countries with less developed capitalism produce less um, gas emissions. We do produce gas emissions, but in less quantity. What can you see in this image? Those are the air networks, white, shipping routes, blue, global roads, green. Here you can see, see the same thing. The greatest amount of air networks and shipping routes are produced in Japan, China, United States, Europe, same places. This is a NASA map by joining um, nighttime pictures of our planet from space. What can you see there? First of all, uh, there's a lot of light. This expresses um, that there is um, light pollution. For some animal species, this is this is a really huge deal. Some of them has have gone extinct. If you transform those light points into heat points, because they do produce heat. All of that that we see light up is making our planet warmer. There is more light density in those more developed countries, China, United States, Japan, Europe, India. And we have to add uh, the following, which is really important. We're 8 billion people. Eight billion. Six billion live in the northeast hemisphere, and then two in the south. So that's where the greatest working class lives. They have all concentrated um, elements to solve this issue. This does not mean that we do not have any responsibility or liability regarding this, because we also suffer in climate crisis and what they do uh, affects us and impacts us as well. That could only change if they change as well. And we cannot forget that our commitment implies producing that spark that can light up that fire.
estamos diciendo que el socialismo es la alternativa. We are saying that socialism is the alternative, but it is socialism controlled by workers with democratic plans, not with state capitalism, multinational uh, companies, and other forms of planification and production for the interest of a minority, nor bureaucracy. It has to be at the service of the benefit of humanity and preservation of nature. It has to be democratic. It has to be controlled from the bottom up. It has to be controlled by workers who produce all material wealth of our society as a whole. Thank you, Professor Fernando. Now, National Coordinator of the Red Ecosocialista and um, from the MST, Argentina. Can you hear me? Perfect. Bueno, creo que eh, entre los cuatro paneles previos. Well, I think that regarding last four panels and this the diagnosis that Fernando proposed, I think that we have a lot of resources and information to deeply debate um, the conditions for a transition, a post-capitalist or post-extractivist transition towards a socialist model inherited by an ecocide capitalism in the 21st century. Well, first of all, some statements, like reference, reference points, so that we can begin. The meaning of uh, doing a forum like this is to debate, to discuss, to enhance this uh, phenomena comprehension and to propose exits and ways out. But there are debates in socio-environmental activism, in which it is important to develop a socialist, internationalist, and anti-capitalist uh, approach. I think that it is obvious to say that a system that it's based in workers' exploitation, racism, homophobia, imperialism, patriarchy has no condition to restore itself, to re regulate itself, to limit their um, polluting actions or to build a relationship that's different with the non-human nature that it imposes. To change the relationship with this um, non-human nature, we need a different civilization approach, a different world conception, which is not based on oppression and on exploitation. So there's a, a first definition, I think, that we all agree with this, but it, that it is part of a global debate. How can we curb, how can we stop this catastrophe. We, we share and, and, and we agree deeply and more partially everything that has been stated. And actually this catastrophe that we are going through is not an accidental result of an abusive management or savage management of capitalism, but it is actually the undeniable consequence of this um, model of production of its social relationships and links 
um, the political power that organizes anarchically the world, mobilized by an exclusively anti-human, anti-social um, approach, which is the private benefit and economic accumulation of a privileged minority. That's why I, I think we can draw a first conclusion that is the need of dismantling capitalism to build a um, transitional bridge towards another kind of civilization, a human civilization, and another kind of relationship between that civilization and um, nature. I think that's key for our perspective. So what is eco-socialism as a project for us? As a definition, it would be, on the one hand, it's like a synthesis of socialist values and also the most radical tradition of anti-capitalist political and ecological anti-systemic approach with a ecological sensitivity, but that um, questions the roots of the capitalist global system. Our socialism is not any socialism. Our socialism is the one that completes the sense and perspective of the anti-capitalist ecological approach. It is an anti-capitalism from the bottom up. It's anti-bureaucracy, it's anti-Stalinist, and it is a non-productivist capitalist uh, socialism. We do not, uh, we disregard this um, producing just to produce, uh, but with a worker's control. We take up on deep coordinates of the original Marxism to democratically plan economy, to produce socially needed goods, not things to be monetized or marketed. And those are strong positions that break us apart from Stalinism and from the whole experience of the ex-Soviet Union. And the eco-socialism that we elaborate and act upon attempts to surpass productivism, which is actually even present on non-Stalinist Marxist left to break apart from the idea that capitalism is some kind of engine, a progress engine that produces abundantly and that at the end of the day, the issue is actually the social way of distribution of that wealth and the access that the masses have to that wealth. And that in fact, that can be solved and changed by um, changing the person that manages or allocates that wealth. For us, uh, we have to pull the uh, emergency brake on this engine. Capitalism has a kind of over life, that uh, artificial life of more than 100 years that has not only frozen productive forces in a humanist um, sense, let's say, regarding uh, applied science and techniques and advances for the um, entirety of humanity and nature. It's been one century. Uh, this is a crystallized um, um, phenomena uh, of frozen productive forces. In the last 40 years, we have uh, de-evolution, have destructive forces. That's why we like to repeat, and because we agree with this Lenin's definition, which is beautiful and it's precise and accurate, and we could update it a little bit that under the conditions of monopoly capitalism in the 20th century, there was an opening of an epoch of a challenge in transition, which is marked by crisis, 
wars, but also we think we need to add pandemics, ecocide and revolutions in order to complete this uh, diagnosis on the long term, which we are going through right now. Some of the debates that we consider are very important in um, social environmental activism in different organizations with ecologist, uh, ecological sensitivity. There is an aspect about uh, power, the state, that it's kind of a taboo um, issue. How can we take power without power taking us? In the struggle to stop and repair this environmental catastrophe led by capitalism, we have to face a plan of systemic changes, which is national, which is regional, which is also international, and that also um, is integrated by uh, different plans of the, in the economy, uh, private property, um, political system. It has a cultural aspect as well. The necessary transition for a kind of a saviorship of eco-environmental uh, from society questions the base of these economic privileges of the capitalist minority. And it is the regime of the private property of production mechanisms. So as we are trying to end the privilege of the 1% of humanity of that um, parasite class, uh, genocidal um, chauvinist and pol polluting class, there is no kind of possible negotiation with that power regime that was built by that minority, which defends um, the world as it is its institution, the state, monopolic violence, which is organized, its instruments, traditional parties, uh, trade union bureaucracies, which their producers of common sense to legitimate um, also their proposals of green capitalism and other answers to guarantee the privilege of that social minority. So the issue of political power, which is key for any kind of transition, it is it becomes key in the in, in social movements and international organizations as the ISL and each of our national organizations. And that's why without being dramatic about it, political struggle for power to build another social mo model is a needed condition for this challenge that, that we are going through right now. Without fighting for another kind of political power that reorganizes everything, there is no way to stop this, this catastrophe. It is not an option. It is a necessity, a practical necessity. It is a need. to kick everyone out, those who are in power, those who decide, we need to take the material base of their privilege. Their elements of economy and production, it is impossible to think of a transition to another mode of production without that of this ongoing crisis and catastrophe. Because either way, this artificial prolonged life of capitalism that had revolution and counter-revolutions to world wars, fascism, is uh, facing, it's presenting today um, 
social environmental agenda as a challenge today. It's that that was not a challenge that Marx and Engels had to face, that they had to face another kind of challenge uh, setting the basis for um, scientific socialism and first political organizations of the working class. It was not a challenge for Lenin either, who had a challenge of solving the equation of the uh, working state. It wasn't a challenge for Trotsky, who had to fight against the um, against Stalinist bureaucracy. So it is a challenge that we have as our own generation. So it is a key fact, life or death, for a socialist, um, forecast. But, but until we reach that, we have a path of conscious commitment of willingness, organization. So this thing about this thing about power and state, and this is something we discuss with activists and different organizations in which we share a field of common action and unity. There are ideas of coexistence between these productivist states and building autonomous uh, regions, like in a strategy, not as, a, let's say, a resistance mode moment, but actually as in a strategy, like uh, non-capitalist islands in capitalism. as if that was a possible um, alternative in this struggle for power that only ends up with frustration, waste of effort and time. And if there's something that we do not have today is time. So capitalism has its roots in national uh, countries, it, it built this state, national state nature. If we don't fight against that, there is no way we can transition to another kind of, of model of organization. If we do not advance in a national transformation towards a regional one, towards an international one, which was such a huge debate uh, among socialists historically. This allows us to enter the 21st century with a heritage and conclusions. And they have to do with uh, political democracy, with the arguing and discussion of ideas and being able to accept that none of us have the last word and that that kind of approach is destructive for us, that we need creative and open thinking in order to build a revolutionary perspective. But because of the difficulties and pressures that it present themselves in this uh, struggle towards political power, we cannot uh, give up this fight. We cannot, uh, what, what would happen if tomorrow we would be the ones to lead this revolutionary process? Some comrades talked about that in panel number three. Um, let's stop with the diagnosis, which are the proposals, which are the uh, measures. There's no receipt for this. There's no receipt. It's not a, a cake you can bake. There are coordinates and there are priorities that mark somehow the way for our key strategy, 
which consists on suppressing the logic of private profit and work exploitation. There's a lot to dismantle and to reorganize. We need to dismantle energy monopolies, mainly oil and agribusiness as a whole. Um, also fishing, animal industrialization, dismantling uh, monopolies on market and finances. of private banks that play a key role in this um, in this moment. And that that we have to dismantle is um, it has a specific objective, which is to create a combined matrix of diverse energy, clean, renewable, Regarding food, we need to reaffirm food as a right, healthy, approachable food. We need an agrarian reform, an agricultural reform, and we need to start a process of implementation of agroecological uh, production. But in a bigger scale, like a public policy, like a state measure, regional planning, so that we can get rid of every element of the um, production circuit that make makes everything more expensive. Uh, countries and people's federations and associations, a public banking system, reorientation of social savings, public transportation as not to boost um, individual vehicles with control of workers and users and also that is key to diminish gas emissions as it has been discussed in the lithium panel as well. The broadening of the quality and gratuity of uh, public services like rights, health, education, culture, tourism, leisure. There is an, a broadening of public services, quality rights guaranteed by a state with a different orientation prohibition of capitalist um, ads against this uh, crazy consumption perspective and information as a so social service, the right to access information. Information cannot be a good to be sold and cannot be led by profitability being able to socialize and making those uh, private economy resources and forces of production collective. And to as well in immediately at the beginning of any kind of transformation process supporting mobilization, an inventory of all sectors and productive 
branches that are not useful and have been heritage of the capitalist, capitalist system and to plan mass consumption with a re-educational approach, for example, with um, program obsolescence, which is linked to these capital rotation cycles, as Fernando mentioned before. It is key to suppress and disregard all of those branches that are not useful and do not answer to any need with uh, workers relocation because we are classists of the working class and our sensitivity, uh, ecological sensitivity is marked with that. We should eliminate all imperialism, neocolonial logic to suspend and not pay any foreign debt to guarantee a free right to migration, to end with racism, to guarantee the right of those um, farmers um, communities and indigenous communities. Our conception of our anti-capitalist anti conception, eco-socialist conception, that is not productivist, is deeply internationalist, but also plurinational. We, we think that it is an unquestionable, unquestionable right to be able to self-identify as a people. Since we are not capitalists and we are not productivists, we are not on the rates to, to generate more profits. So it is completely compatible with uh, multinationalities. So in our world, there is place and there is a space for everyone without any kind of discrimination. And another thing is time economy. Because on the one hand, it is really important to guarantee the right um, to work, to, for all of us to work or to work less. The reduction of our working shifts by distributing all the work among all of us with uh, with equal salaries and wages equal to the family basket. There would be a cultural revolution in social relationships and participation because if you reduce shifts, you would guarantee, of course, the basic needs to live, but also you would guarantee a social free time that would allow a leap in society, more social free time to participate and elaborate politics for all um, human qualities that have been capitalized by capitalism, which produces um, individual frustration. There would be a revolution, a cultural explosion if we didn't have those limits. If we did have time for develop each of them. We fight to transform this reality and reorganize economy and those uh, social relationships on new basis. But that's for the complete individual freedom, freedom from all exploitation from capitalism. This is a key point of our perspective. And this is the last thing I will say, the size of this transition and which are the subjects that we need 
to lead that transition, that post-capitalist transition. All of these changes do not imply a linear uh, process because in politics and class struggle, the current conditions are unequal and are combined because capitalism is global and internationalist as well. It's uh, exploitation and oppression internationalism smartly divides peoples with frontiers, with borders. So our internationalism, which is socialist and anti-capitalism, is like a cure for that um, national cages. But we know that the starting point of those uh, revolutions are national. That's how they begin, the dialectic of revolutions, those explosions, spontaneous or semi-spontaneous rebellions, uprisings that alter all um, capitalist control mechanism and stops that control in an un unequal manner. So our the, the key is to know that when those processes begin, the social programs of those revolutions are actually a, like a negative program. They are, they know what they do not want. They do not know what they do want. The measures and the program, everything that we spoke about today needs uh, training, specialized uh, preparations. And that's why we need to build a bigger and bigger organization, because in order to make the changes needed, we need a conscious, collective, permanent, national and international organization. And that's the key to act as a sort of presence in the social movement when it's expanding, when it's uh, leading rebellions, when it finally explodes, to be able to give that explosion, to give that rebellion an uprising, sometimes massive, abrupt, and from time to time, but that under capitalism are quite regular to give them meaning and an objective perspective. That's the objective of the International Socialist League and its organizations in the five continents. And to know and be aware that us, we, without any kind of dogmatism or anything, we know that it is the working class that plays a key role, not because, not only because of its size, which is huge, but because of its strategic position in the productive uh, model. Without the working class, we wouldn't be able to talk about these changes. It would be impossible. So our revolutionary project at the end of the day com combines this red democratic socialism, but also this different uh, relationship with non-human nature to radically change our world, ours, not the one person, but ours. Thank you, Mariano. We are going to read some of the questions that we have on the chat and some of the questions that were made to me personally. The issue of applying eco-socialist measure has to do necessarily with how we establish socialism in the world to be able to raise awareness uh, on socialism for people to accept the need to end with capitalism. That's a question from Shenny. I have a question for panelists. Some of the slogans are proposed for uh, companies to take care of waste management. 
of, uh, of their products. That's a demand that has an important logic in the sense of not reproducing this speech of um, individual liability, but companies' liability. But it makes us workers passive on the face of capitalism taking care of this issue when it won't. So which do you think are the immediate and transitional measures and slogans that we should use in our programs and demands as well? And Gonzalo says, in this framework of the struggle for power as a strategy, workers can use our organization to play a role that supervisor of the effects, environmental effects of the companies in which we work, opposed to the vision and practices of bureaucracies and bosses, the demand and initiative of the working class. Adding to our agenda, the claims to the companies in which we work. And that's how we propose ourselves to control those companies socially. How would we answer to blockades and attacks from imperialism in this process of dismantling the monopolies that you mentioned? In those uh, revolutionary moments that you spoke about, which is the determinant, uh, definitive um, issue or element for the working class to reach power. The capitalist system did not stop with Menem's government. It seems not to ever stop, but how is it that people in private uh, neighborhoods keep, keep on consuming our na natural habitats, inhabitants? Can we advance in a revolution without uh, educational uh, revolution, or revolution? How can we be a critic consumers in school? What should we do when people call us dreamers or utopians? When people tell us that those things that we socialists um, say are not possible. Were you able to understand or were they a little bit confusing? Yes, I understood. Okay, you can process the questions and then you can raise your hands and then you can answer. It's that most of the questions are for you, Mariano. A lot of polemic. What I can say about the questions that have been made, some are very specific about Argentina. I'm in Colombia. I can tell you something, Fernando, that you can incorporate. Because here in Argentina, we have a lot of fanatics of the false progressives. And Petro has shown himself as someone who fights against fracking. So if you can say something about that. Look, about some of the questions that have to do with that question, that relation between struggles for reforms and revolution. That is a timeless discussion, reform or revolution. The struggle for reforms is inevitable, it's necessary, of course, but they must be conceived as struggles of resistance, that they will not achieve any substantive, substantive change. It won't change, and wage increase will not change the exploitative nature of wage labor. There's struggles of resistance that are in a, an eternal cycle 
but it is necessary because it is the manner through which workers learn to struggle, to identify the enemy, to realize their own strength, to raise their consciousness, which has to do with this question about consciousness and education models. We think of a pedagogy of revolution, if it were possible to give many horses, there is a change that is absolute when you are involved in that exploitation and that struggle. You have to you assimilate that there are problems, but that this is normal. So when you're in the ex in the exploitative experience, it is almost impossible to change that consciousness under that experience. So the class struggle is the school for the working class. Now, there is a sector that is important, which is the revolutionary intellectuals. That sector can reach through ideas and take up positions on the basis of those ideas, not necessarily because their life led them to those conclusions, but through being a human that can perceive things and arrive at a Marxist thinking of society, understand the necessity of a struggle to fight for socialism. In fact, most revolutionaries were like this. Marx was not a worker. Lenin wasn't either. They came from middle-class families. We have to have a policy towards that sector because it becomes important in the revolutionary struggle. Lenin's line towards the building of the revolutionary party was the linking of that sector with the working class vanguard. And that those the link between those two sectors would build the party. Almost always that the conditions of the class struggle are analyzed. An important part is analyzing how that intellectual sector is positioned. What are they thinking? What are they? Are they concerned? Are they turning left or are they? That's a very important question because it gives us an idea of what possibilities we have to build the parties. Parties aren't a voluntary act. They are a product of these confluences. Of course, there, have, there has to be a will to build it, but it's those opportunities that have to be taken advantage of. In relation to the relation between the workers and the small and large capitalists, the relation that effectively exists is that one is exploited and the other is an exploiter, be it a small, medium, or large capitalist. It's a relation of exploitation where one submits the other. Workers denounce what the bosses do. But in that plan of confronting their exploitator, they realize that they are an exploiter and not a good person or whatever. 
Uh, if the worker doesn't recognize first that it is his exploiter, he is submitting to that exploitation. Yeah. 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 Fernando, lo tuteo, al profesor. <laughs> bueno. Mejor compañero, sí. Me gusta Me más esa palabra. Yeah, it's better than professor comrade. Así será. Mariano. Bueno. Sí, el, el eh, creo que ¿Qué es lo apasionante que tiene este tema? En mi opinión. I think what is passionate about this issue is that it obliges us to innovate program and politics. It leads us to certain creative thinking, which is the essence of Marx, of original Marxism, of Lenin and Trotsky's Marxism, who were never dogmatic, which was never about copying and pasting, which is always a doctrine, not a dogma. And so it obliges us to carry out this apl apl applicated Marxism, applied Marxism. given the responsibility of leading a political process of transformation or revolution, having the capacity of influencing, which is desirable for those of us who do political work. It is a, an indispensable issue to take up. We don't take up seriously the social environmental rights because the level of ecological attack, which has a very classist aspect. In that sense, I think there is progress at the same time in the area of mobilization. First, sincerely, I seriously think it is still an ideological struggle against the idea of it being an individual struggle, but I see it in, in retreat, the ideology of individual change. I think the, the youth with the climate strikes they have Greta Thunberg there which they have not been able to assimilate yet they take her to the summits to try to have her say what they want to hear and she ends up you know throwing firing heavy munitions against them there's a cultural sensitivity to this. The problem that it is a systemic problem. Then the programmatic discussion, the transition and how to pass from this matrix to another one leads you to a debate over logical questions with the complexity of not having an example to point to today of which way we want to go. And the most well-known experiences that are known in the so-called real socialism, that capitalism has made sure to make well-known, has comparable points almost worse than capitalism
per capita en los países de la ex -UR, bajo las condiciones del estado. The CO2 emissions per capita in the ex-Soviet states are nefarious, but it has nothing to do with the working class and socialism. It has to do with the bureaucracy and its race to compete with U.S. imperialism in GDP. Because even the bureaucrats that led the factories had incentives and quotas of volume of production to meet. But we can't uh, pass the bill of Stalinism to the working class. So we can't. We can't own up to that. And there's a struggle against the common sense of individual responsibility. We haven't won that struggle, but there is a favorable moment in that struggle. And it's global because there are very dynamic situations in environmental struggles practically everywhere in the world. In Argentina, we had, and there's examples from all over the world, but we had very important instances of the intervention of the working class in ecological struggles. In Chubut, in the Patagonia, against an attempt to give over the water of the mountain range to the mining companies there were strikes that uh, blocked the roads that made pickets that confronted that legislation and against a union bureaucracy that is productivist that associates that struggle for labor rights from the environmental impacts that capitalist production produces. And obviously, if there isn't a strong eco-socialist tendency that combines social justice with ecological justice, then the idea can grow that ecologists want workers to lose their jobs. Obviously, the working class, like Fernando was saying, advances from experience to consciousness. But that that advance is not lineal or inevitable. So there's a role to play, which leads us to the necessity of a program that helps lead from that experience to the struggles. A lot of these issues that we discussed in the Second Congress of the ISL in Barcelona on the session on environmental struggles. We discussed, for example, organizing working class commissions, mixed commissions of workers and environmental and community organizations in the areas where there are projects of ecological impact as a way of committing workers in the discussion over the impacts of ecological issues of production and taking into account the health of the workers and also the communities in the, those areas. A program that can begin to influence in the working class it's, and its most mobilized sectors 
with these issues as well. But the comrades from Tigre, Nord Delta of Argentina were asking where there are neighbor, rich neighborhoods built on wetlands. We carried out a campaign from the network that we could that we learned from the feminist struggle, taking the example of the campaign for sex education, defending a program of in comprehensive sex education in schools. And we carried out a campaign for a ecological education for public schools to incorporate scientific curriculum on ecological issues. Unlike today where it's not there and some individual teachers can incorporate some things, but I think we need to work on reaching out, especially to the youngest sectors. Discussion of whether we need to carry out first a education revolution and have a conscious majority before we can fight for these transformations. I think the political process of the class struggle, the mechanics, the dialectical mechanics have shown over 150 years that that process is more complex, more it doesn't have those uh, clear stages that it is more combined. The evolution of the masses, the people, workers, their spontaneous eruption on the scene is initiates these processes. which are part of a process of, that builds up but sometimes explodes where the day-to-day -day alienation of going to work and going home the struggle for survival all of a sudden radicalizes in entire swaths of people and they involve, get involved in politics, but without the level of consciousness that we would like. And that is where the connection between the unconscious, spontaneous aspect and the conscious one, the explosions of the people with their anger with their ire with their explosions and the previous work that revolutionaries activists have to take up those of us who have to build strength and influence because struggles and rebellions will continue happening But having the influence to lead them implies a patient work of building, of explaining, of training ourselves, of 
becoming more of multiplying for each of us to become hundreds or thousands in every workplace, in every university, winning over a sector of intellectuals to these ideas. And that process doesn't wait for rebellions. We have to do it beforehand. We have to start yesterday. Those of us who attempt in a committed way in all the organizations that are part of the ISL in most 30 countries with the situation that we have in each country is so that when those rebellions occur, the accumulation, the accumulation you have up to that point provides the possibility or not of influencing in that explosion, not just retreating to a previous point, but rather all those radicalized people joining organization, strengthening and building a stronger force. This is our task. I think our, our task is this one. Lastly, this idea, what would happen if the chain breaks in one of our weaker countries you know if the revolution begins in the united states we can initiate the transition through what's up in a number of countries the central nervous system of capitalism is there if it is interrupted there it would be much easier but those in power also learn how to stay in power. They adapt. It's not as easy. Although they are not so healthy either. We are seeing important process of mobilization and struggles in France, in the UK. Now, what if it starts in one of the peripheral countries and one of our more semi-colonial countries how will imperialism react will they blockade us like we say in, in the countryside in argentina the first thing is to cure our health our hypothesis is that in whatever country we begin the revolutionary process, there's going to be reactions. Revolutions generate counter-revolutions. It's typical of these processes. It's a logical symptom. Now, if there is a previously built international organization that asks that works as a network of solidarity that will help and prop up that initial revolutionary process but if it also takes place under the current circumstance of capitalism in which the bourgeoisie around the world is terrified of any change that is even minimally seriously reformist because they don't have the 
elements to contain them, like when they had the Soviet Union that played that role. Not having that tool, they are terrified of any phenomenon that they will not be able to control. That's why they act quickly to try to co-opt, assimilate, or break off. Like has happened with every reformist experience of the last few years. Our optimism is an optimism that tries to be scientific. Comes from the fact that we see that if we are able to develop strong militant organizations to begin with, achieving that they be more numerous with more active members, but we also enrich our program. And we anticipate like chess players, the agenda of the socio-environmental struggles, for example. in the middle of inter-imperialist tensions and everything that's going on in the world. If we reach a revolutionary situation in one country, I think we are in better conditions today than in many other moments in history. Because capitalism is not doing well and can't point to anywhere in the world where they are solving people's problems but is advancing more and more and concentrating everything in less and less hands. That is why in my report, I emphasize the struggle for power and necessity of organization, that this isn't a secondary program, but the most prerequisite of necessities today because capitalism leads us to that ruin it has no other road it leads us to revolutions the key is if we reach those revolutions with sufficient preparation so priority is to put all our efforts into building the best and strongest organizations we are able to build. To be able to fight off any attack or counter-revolution. Because we are in an era in which if we are able to achieve the fight for power in any country, it would be clearly contagious in our region, surely, and we think across the world. That is a strategic hypothesis. It's a, it's a task for many. So those of you who are not yet part, eh, we need you. En primera instancia, agradecer a, al compañero Fernando, al compañero Mariano. Por, so we thank Fernando, Mariano, for the reports, their time, and all the comrades who have participated today, from early today, all day, we have to reflect on the building of organizations to save the planet from capitalism. We will be inviting you surely to new forums of debate. Each of the sections of the ISL across the world. Thank you all comrades. We'll see you next time around.